Hello everybody, happy another day of electrochemistry. Today we are talking about electrolytic cells. So, we recently learned about galvanic cells, and the way that galvanic cells work is they take chemical energy and they convert it into electrical energy. And they do this by um, harnessing the power of spontaneous or favorable redox reactions. So now we're gonna learn about the electrolytic cell. And this one's a little bit different. So instead of taking chemical to electric energy to um, power things, what electrolytic cells do is they convert electrical energy into chemical energy that we can use to drive non-spontaneous or non-favorable reactions to make them occur. So in these cells, your energy is supplied by a power source or a battery, basically. Um, so why are these really important? Well, think about non-favorable reactions. Non-favorable reactions mean that they just, it doesn't mean that they like can't ever happen. It just means that they need a constant source of energy in order to make them happen. So what we can use electrolytic cells for is to make these non-spontaneous reactions work. So that way we can harness their power to do work. So in order to determine the reaction that takes place at your cathode, what we're going to do is list all possible reduction reactions and the voltages of reduction reactions. This will make a little bit more sense when I start doing examples with you. But what you're going to decide is what's the reaction that actually takes place at the cathode? It's going to be the reduction that has the highest voltage. All right, so then to determine the oxidation that takes place at the anode, same thing, list all possible oxidation reactions and the voltages of each. And then the one that has the highest voltage is gonna be the one that uh, is taking place at the anode. Okay, so the power supply required to operate your electrolytic cell will be equal to the overall voltage for the electrolytic cell, same as galvanic for, the, for that one. All right, so there's three types of electrolytic cells we're going to look at. The first, you have inert electrodes, so something like platinum or graphite, in a molten electrolyte solution. So what does that actually mean? So molten electrolyte solution means you have some ionic salt that um, is in a liquid state. It's molten. So if I take this example of my electrolytic cell right here, you'll see it looks pretty similar to a galvanic cell, except there's only one um, reaction flask, I guess you can call it, where this is happening, rather than two separate reaction flasks um, connected by a salt bridge. So you have both of your electrodes in the same solution and they are connected by that battery, that power source. So if I were to have molten NaCl in this solution, what that means is this thing is going to break apart to form its ions, Na plus and Cl minus. So what we need to decide is what uh, reaction is happening, what half reaction is happening at each of the electrodes. So Remember um, an ox and a red cat. What this reminds us is that we know um, oxidation happens at the anode and reduction happens at the cathode. So for the cathode, we're looking for our reduction reaction. So if we take a look at what's happening here, our two possibilities is that we have Na plus that's going to react to form Na solid. We have Cl minus that's going to react to form Cl2. Okay, so which one's going to be oxidized? Which one's going to be reduced? Well, in order for sodium to go from a plus one oxidation state to a zero oxidation state, it had to gain electrons, so it must be being reduced. So at the um, cathode, we know that sodium is going to be reacting. Sodium ions are going to be reacting to form sodium solid. So remember for our half reactions, we have to balance them out by um, adding in electrons. So how many electrons do I need to gain to go down that oxidation state? Just one, so plus E minus. So if you were to take a look at the um, uh, table of standard reduction potentials that I gave you, you will find that for this half reaction, the E naught value is negative 2.71 volts. 
All right, so anode half reaction. That means here we're taking Cl minus and we're producing um, Cl2, elemental chlorine. So if I need to produce Cl2, the first step to balancing this half reaction would be balancing my chlorine. So I need two chlorines here. All right, so in order for me to um, oxidize this chlorine, I must be <clears throat> um, losing two electrons when I do this. So I'm going to add two electrons to the right-hand side right there. So if you take a look at your table of standard reduction potentials for the, re for the um, oxidation reaction that we have here, the e naught value is negative 1.36 volts. So to combine these and write the overall reaction, I'm going to do this without showing you the actual math step for it, but we have to have our electrons balance out. So that first reaction, the cathode half reaction, I would have to multiply by two to get my electrons to cancel before summing them. So my final overall reaction will be two Na plus plus, <clears throat> excuse me, two Cl minus to yield two Na plus Cl2. So to calculate the power that must be supplied to operate this cell, we sum those um, voltages. So E naught cell for this electrolytic cell would be negative 2.71 plus negative 1.36 for a total of negative 4.07 volts. So this makes sense, right? This is an unfavorable reaction. So if our E cell value is negative, it means it's non-spontaneous. So what we have to do is put in at least this much energy in order to drive this reaction, in order to get this thing to work. So we need to supply at least 4.07 volts of energy to the cell. All right, so this is our first possible um, electrolytic cell. You've just got inert electrodes, the only thing that could possibly be um, oxidized or reduced here is the stuff from that molten um, electrolyte solution. Type two, now you've got inert electrolyte, um, now you've got inert electrodes in, um, an electrolyte solution. Oh, I'm so sorry. Type one, I said molten electrolyte, but I kept using the word solution. I did not mean to use the word solution there. It's just molten electrolyte. The only thing in there is liquid ionic solid. Type two is when you have the electrolyte solution. So now you have an ionic compound that has been dissolved in water. So the difference here is that in the first one, you only have those ions that are coming from your um, molten salt, but now these things have broken apart to form their ions in water. So what's all of the stuff that we possibly have in this beaker? Well, we've got Na plus ions, we've got I minus ions, but we also have water and water can be oxidized or reduced. So if you take a look at the standard reduction tables potential or standard reduction potentials table that I gave you, you'll find that there are two reactions for water, when it's being oxidized and when it's being reduced. So in this situation, there's no clear cut which one's being oxidized, which one's being reduced, because we have four potential reactions that we're dealing with. So if we start out by writing our reduction reactions, our potential reduction reactions... We know that sodium could be potentially reduced, Na plus, plus an electron, to yield Na. But the other possible reduction that can happen is water. If you have water, you could produce hydrogen gas and hydroxide ions. So to get there, to balance this whole thing out, what it looks like is two waters plus two electrons yields hydrogen gas and two hydroxides. So we have to consult the E um, not values for both of these reactions. If we look at the table, the reduction of sodium, well, actually we have the reduction of sodium from the previous problem, is negative 2.71 volts. And the reduction of water is negative 0 0.83 volts. So how do we decide which one is actually being reduced? We go back to this rule I gave you up here. 
the reduction reaction that takes place is the one with the highest voltage. So that means this one is the highest voltage. It's the number that's most positive, right? So that means that water is being reduced here. So this is our cathode half reaction. Okay, now we have to do the same thing for our um, oxidation half reactions to decide which one is going to oxidize. So we already know that water is being reduced, which means that it can't, it probably isn't being oxidized. I don't want to say can't, but probably isn't being oxidized. Um, so if we wrote that reaction out, what it would look like for the oxidation of water is we would produce oxygen gas plus hydrogen ions and then four electrons to balance this out. Its E cell value is negative 1.23 volts. So the other possible oxidation that can be happening is iodine. So what would this look like? Well, this would be I minus ions going to produce elemental iodine. So balance this out, add two over there. Since we're oxidizing, we'll be um, losing two electrons, just like that. And this E cell value is 0 0.53 volts. So what's actually being oxidized? The iodine. It's got the higher value, so it must be the half reaction that's happening at the anode. So this is our anode half reaction. Okay. So to write the overall reaction, we just sum these two. We already have two electrons in each, so I'm just going to um, add down. And we end up with 2I minus plus 2H2O yields I2 plus H2 plus OH minus. All right, so here's an extra note that we're going to write in that's kind of interesting here. Notice that you're producing hydroxide ions. So what that means is the solution would become more basic due to production of those hydroxides. The other thing you're producing here is H2. So this is elemental hydrogen in its gaseous form. So H2 is produced as a gas that bubbles out. Okay, so those are just a couple of extra notes for this type of cell that are important to notice. All right, so um, calculate the power that must be supplied to operate the cell. So for these, we're going to add our E cell values um, for each of our half reactions. And when we do that, E cell naught is equal to negative 1.36 volts. So we need to supply at least 1.36 volts to the cell. Again, makes sense because we're getting a negative value and this is an unfavorable reaction, which is why we have to put a battery on it. All right, last type of um, electrolytic cell we're going to take a look at is reactive electrodes in an electrolyte solution. So now in our electrolyte solution, what do we have to deal with? Well, for this one, we have um, H plus ions we have to worry about. We have Br ions that we have to worry about. We're in solution, which means we have water we have to worry about. But now we have reactive electrodes. So these possible electrodes could also react. So we also have to deal with um, solid silver. All right. So let's take a look at all the possible reactions that could happen here. So for reduction... What could possibly be happening? Well, we could have H plus that uh, gets reduced to produce hydrogen gas. Remember that um, our table of standard reduction potentials is based around the reduction of hydrogen. Um, so the reduction of hydrogen has an E naught value of zero volts. Um, oops, got to balance that. Add a two right there. Perfect. Okay, so the other thing that could be getting reduced is water. So just like before, we're going to write out our reduction of water equation. 
to OH minus. And we know that our E naught value for this is negative 0.83 volts from the previous problem. So if we take a look at those two things, what's the bigger number? Well, obviously it's going to be zero. That's the more positive number, which means that reduction must be happening for hydrogen ions at the cathode. So I'm going to write this as our cathode half reaction. All right, now the anode. Okay. So here's where it gets a little tricky because now we have an extra thing to worry about. We've got our silver to worry about. So uh, for oxidation, what could be happening? Well, we could be oxidizing water. So we know this one from the previous um, page is this equation right here with an E value of one, negative 1 1.23 volts. Um, the other thing that could be happening is we could be oxidizing bromine. So we have bromide ions becoming elemental bromine. The E naught value for this, negative 1.07 volts. The last thing that could be getting oxidized is our silver. So if we have silver being oxidized, it's going to go from solid silver to producing silver ions, which means it must be losing one electron when it does this. And this has an E naught value of negative 0.80. So since this is the largest E naught value, that means that this is the oxidation that's happening at the anode. So I'm gonna rewrite this equation into letter B. All right, so sum these to write the overall reaction. Our reduction at the anode only has one electron, so I'd have to double that before I sum them. And when I do that, I end up with 2Ag plus 2H plus. My electrons cancel out, and I yield 2Ag plus plus H2 gas. All right, so how much power do I need to supply to make this work? Sum my E naught values. And I end up with E cell is equal to negative 0.80 volts. So we need to supply at least 0 0.80 volts to the cell. All right, so those are our three types of um, electrolytic cells. Um, I put a couple of practice problems in the homework assignment that you're going to use to run through this practice set again, just using the notes that I gave you. Um, but I do want you to be able to do these processes on your own based on um, being able to recognize what type of electrodes you have and what type of um, solution they're setting in. Okay, so next section that we're going to deal with here is current calculations. So this is all about electrochemistry, right? And electricity is all based on this idea of flow of electrons, and the flow of electrons is defined as a current. So um, the current supplied by the power source for a given amount of time can be related to the mass change or the charge of the metal of an electrode. Here is the calculation for the current, um, or here is the equation for how to calculate current. I is equal to Q over T. So this is capital I, lowercase q, lowercase t. So let's define what each of these variables means. Hopefully you're able to recognize two of these for sure. So I is equal to your current. The units for current are capital A amperes. So an amp, one amp, one ampere, is defined as being one coulomb per second. And this is critically important because of the way that this equation is set up, because Q is defined as your charge. Hopefully you remember that from Coulomb's law. So Q is defined as your charge, and the units of charge are capital C, coulombs. So what you need to know is that one mole of electrons has a charge of one Faraday. That's another unit. And what we need to know is that one Faraday is equal to 96485 coulombs. 
This you do not need to have memorized. It is on your constant sheet for AP. Okay, last variable we have to define, lowercase t. Hopefully this one's like most familiar to you. This one is time. Yes, measured in seconds, has to be seconds. So what we're saying here is current is defined as your charge over time. So your electrons that are flowing per unit of time. So let's get some examples figuring out how we can calculate current and then um, we'll do some practice problems. So consider the half reaction, copper two plus reacting or um, plus two electrons to produce solid copper. Okay, so think about what's happening really quick in this reaction. Is this an oxidation or is this a reduction? We're adding electrons to the system. We're gaining electrons, so we must be reduced. Okay, so what mass of copper is produced if 10 amps is supplied over 30 minutes? So what information are we given? We're given current, 10 amps, and we're given time, 30 minutes. What are we asked to find? Mass of copper. Okay, so how can we get mass if all we know is amps, current, or time? Well, if we know current and we know time, we can do something with charge, right? We can get Q. Okay, so let's start there. So first thing we need to do is we know that this 30 minutes, minutes are a no-no. So I got to convert this to seconds. Well, in one minute, there are 60 seconds. So when I cancel my units, I end up with, I'm going to write this in scientific notation, 1.80 1 times 10 to the third seconds. Come on, dimensional analysis. Yes, love to see you. Welcome back. All right, so I've got time now and I've got current. So I need to figure out how to get charge. Well, I know that I is equal to Q over T, which means that Q is equal to I times T. All right, I can work with that. Okay, so my current I know is 10 amps, 10.0, and an amp is equal to a coulomb per second. Great. Multiply this by my time, which is 1.80 times 10 to the third seconds, and look at that, my units cancel. Yes. Seconds cancel with seconds. I'm left with units of coulombs, which is what charge should be measured in. Okay, plugging this in our calculator, we end up with Q being equal to... 1.80 times 10 to the fourth coulombs. Okay, what the heck am I going to do with this? Well, here's what I know. I know that a coulomb can be related to a faraday. And I know that a faraday can be related to moles of electrons. And I have a balanced chemical equation here that includes electrons and the species that I'm trying to get to, copper. So this is just a stoic problem. It's just a dimensional analysis problem. It's just thinking through what variables you have, what you know, and what you need to know. So I know that I'm starting out with charge. That's my first term in my dimensional analysis. So I got to get away from charge. So I'm going to do that to get to moles of electrons. So um, there are 9 d6,485 coulombs of charge being carried by one mole of electrons. From my balanced chemical equation, I have two moles of electrons for every one mole of copper being reduced. And now if I've got moles of copper, how can I get to mass of copper? Molar mass, what, what? Okay, so one mole of copper 63.55 grams of copper. High molar mass. Missed you. Good old days. All right. Uh, coulombs cancel with coulombs. Moles of electrons, moles of electrons, moles of copper, moles of copper, and I'm left with grams of copper. Yes! So put it in your calculator. What do you end up with? You end up with 5.93 grams of copper. There is my final answer. Yes! All right, so here's what I want you to do. Pause the video and try the practice problem. In this case, you're not doing the exact same thing that I just did. So you think through what are you given? What do you need to solve for? 
and then come on back to check your answer. If you get stuck, the answer key is posted to Canvas, okay? Do, 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 do. Okay, hi, um, welcome back. Hopefully you solved this problem. What you should have ended up with, I asked for the uh, answer in um, units of minutes, so you should have ended up with 31.3 minutes. If you did not get this, go check my work on the answer key and see if I made a mistake. <laughs> totally possible. All right, next page. Um, I think that you are able to do that um, first practice problem as well, but I want to walk you through the last practice problem on this sheet. Um, this one's a little bit different. I'm asking for something a little different. So, Reduction of an ion of titanium is carried out in an electrolytic cell. What is the charge on the ion if a 16.0 amp current is applied for 20 minutes and it produces 3.18 grams of titanium metal? Give the balanced reduction reaction. Okay, so what I'm trying to find here is my balanced reduction reaction. And what does that reduction reaction actually tell you? It's how many electrons you are gaining to go from your reduced state um, or to go from one of your states to your reduced state, right? Your higher oxidation state to your lower oxidation state. So what we're really trying to find in that balanced reduction reaction is how many electrons are being transferred here. Okay. So let's think about what we're given. We're given current, we're given time, we're given mass. Cool. Okay, current and time I know are related and I can get charge out from that. So first things first, ew, minutes, 20.0 minutes, get that into seconds. One minute is 60 seconds. And when you plug that in your calculator, you end up with 1.20 times 10 to the third seconds. Great. Okay. So um, I know that current is equal to charge over time, which means that charge is equal to current times time. So let's plug in what we know. Q is equal to 16.0 coulombs per second or amps times 1.20 times 10 to the third seconds. Units cancel, units cancel. And what I end up with at the end is my charge is 1.92 times 10 to the fourth coulombs. Cool. All right, so this is how much total charge is being carried here. What I need to find out is how much charge is being carried per mole of electrons. So when I do that, I have 1.92 times 10 to the fourth coulombs. I know that one mole of electrons carries a charge of Faraday's constant, 96485 coulombs. So when I plug this into my calculator, I end up with 0 0.199 moles of electrons. Okay, great. So this is how many moles of electrons are being transferred now, but I have a production of 3.18 grams of titanium metal. So I'm given a mass of metal that I'm producing, but I have to figure out how much or how many electrons are being transferred um, per unit or per mole of um, titanium that I'm producing here because this is my total moles of electrons being transferred. I want to figure out how many per singular mole are being transferred. So to do that, I take my 3.18 grams of titanium and I got to convert this thing into moles. Luckily, that's like one of the easiest things we know how to do at this point. We know that one mole of titanium has a mass of 47.90 grams. So cancel, cancel. And when I plug this in my calculator, I end up with 0 0.0664 moles of titanium. So this is how many moles of titanium were produced. Great. This is how many moles of electrons were transferred. So I need to figure out how many moles of electrons were transferred when I produced 0 0.0664 moles of titanium. 
this will get me my total um, moles of electrons, or this will get me my total number of electrons being transferred per titanium that I am making. All right, so when I plug this in my calculator, I get three as my value. So what this is saying is I'm, um, I'm transferring three electrons per titanium in this system. So what does this actually relate to? Well, I came from a titanium three plus ion. I started with a titanium three plus ion, and then I reduced by gaining three electrons to go to titanium um, element. So as a reduction reaction, how do I write that? I start with titanium three plus, I gain three electrons in my system, I reduce to form titanium solid. So this is my reduction reaction. This is what the problem was asking me to solve for. Okay, so um, try out this practice problem up here as well. And then I gave you a page of practice problems to get through all the stuff we've learned about electrochemistry so far. Bye.